Okay, it's now my pleasure to welcome our uh, next plenary speaker for the day, who also happens to be my boss. Uh, I'd like to welcome Sriram Rajamani on the stage. Sriram is a distinguished scientist and managing director of Microsoft Research India. Uh, he basically works in the area of uh, program verification and uh, uh, program uh, synthesis, and he uh, has been awarded the CAV 2011 award for outstanding contributions in software model checking along with Tom Ball. Shriram is also a member, uh, an ACM fellow, and the member of Indian National Academy of uh, Engineering. Uh, over to Shriram uh, for his talk. As Satish mentioned, my, um, my uh, area of research is uh, you know, you know, formal methods uh, and programming languages. Um, and I've been working in you know, formal verification um, for, for a very long time. And um, um, some years ago, I got interested in program synthesis because uh, uh, program synthesis is actually very related to formal verification. The relationship between uh, formal verification and program synthesis is that in formal verification, you have a program and you are trying to prove something about it, uh, some specification uh, uh, holes in the program. And in synthesis, actually, you flip the problem down and you're given a specification and uh, from that you actually try and generate a program that by construction you know, satisfies uh, whatever specification uh, you want to satisfy. But in recent years, I've been very interested in the connection between these fields and machine learning, which is so wildly popular uh, these days. So what, what I'll do in this talk is uh, I, I've structured this talk in, 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 in three parts. Uh, the first one is a little bit more of a tutorial. Uh, I would give, a, even if you're not familiar with program synthesis, I would give you a very gentle uh, a tutorial introduction to program synthesis. And with a disclaimer, uh, I will also give you a, uh, my a programming languages person's view of supervised machine learning. Uh, if you want to beat me up, you know, please do that in private. But, you know, but that's a, you know, I'm not a machine learning expert, but I'll give you, you know, my, uh, uh, the way I understand uh, machine learning. And I can tell you most programming languages people understand machine learning in this way, because I've given this talk uh, at least in programming language with audience, and you know they have they they have at least they haven't vehemently objected um, to these views. Uh, <clears throat> then the second part of my talk, I, I'll talk about uh, a specific problem that I've been working on together with my colleagues for about a year and a half or so, um, which actually um, uh, is at the right at the intersection of program synthesis and machine learning. So some of the tutorial introduction I give you will uh, be useful for you to follow uh, the second portion of portion of this talk. And in the third portion of the talk, I'll talk about broadly what I see other people doing uh, in the area that uh, is at the intersection of uh, program synthesis and machine learning, and broadly uh, programming language techniques and machine learning. So that's, that's roughly my plan. Um, and I'm actually happy if you even interrupt me in the middle of my talk, you know, put, up, put up your hand and I, I'll happy be ta take questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll now start with uh, the introduction. Um, Program synthesis, by the way, is a very old problem. Um, the earliest formulation I know of was done by a church. This is the same church that you know, worked on recursion theory and lambda calculus and so on. And the earliest paper I know of was, was published in 1957, right? Where <clears throat> um, a church gave specifications of um, you know, whatever programs um, uh, he wanted to, to synthesize. And, 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 and he gave specifications as logical relations, um, you know, phi x, y, where x is the input to the program and y uh, is the output from the program. And, um, and he asked a question. Actually, he, in this paper, right, he didn't actually give a solution. He actually posed a problem in 1957. And he said he believed that it should be possible that given a specification, a relational specification like that, is it possible to construct a function f such that for every x, for every input x, if you take x and instead of y, you apply x on f and then get f of x, if that formula holds, then f is a function that implements that specification. So the question Church asked in the paper was, you know, I think it should be, given the specification, it should be possible to algorithmically construct f. And you know he and he actually said actually of, of course you know how you do it depend on depends on the logic in which the specification is actually expressed. And then that um, paper led to a huge amount of work. Um, uh, you know people studied you know I think there was there was a real landmark paper by Buki and Landweber in 1969, and then M O Rabin um, in 1972. They studied you know how to construct this f. And actually you know the problem of synthesis was to construct this f 
given the specification phi x y, and and you know and depending on the logic in which you write phi, you know this this is doable. You know that that's what Bukies and Rabin's paper uh, showed. Um, you know for, you know there's there's actually a logic called monadic second order logic, and for that you could solve this with non-elementary complexity, which means that the amount of time it takes to run the algorithm is a stack of exponentials, which uh, of non-elementary nature. Depending on you know if you do that in temporal logic, then you know these things are p space and exp time. And you know, I, my, I did my PhD in verification and I used to go to this conference called CAV and I know some people who actually have even built tools using these non-elementary algorithms. Um, uh, I, I, I think some of us in formal verification are kind of maniacal, we do that anyway. But, it, but I don't know of anything that realistic that has been done with it. Uh, you know, this is largely of theoretical interest and I think what's fascinating about this is that the space of functions actually is not bounded, right? It's typically, right, for uh, you know, uh, temporal logics and so on, the, the function is actually a finite state machine. It's a finite state transducer which takes inputs and produces outputs, but there is no a priori bound on the number of states that your finite state machine can have. Because of that, right, the, the fact that it's even possible is, you know, it's very non-trivial. Um, and, and actually, you know, in my grad school, I've tried to read uh, Rabin's paper, and it usually takes several months to actually to go through uh, a, a papers in this area. So that's, that's how um, in intellectually deep this area has been. Um, but what has happened, I think, um, uh, in the past maybe 10 years or so, is that a small twist has happened to this problem, which has made this immensely practical. And I'll say what the twist is. The twist is, instead of actually having these functions to be from a very unconstrained and large space, people have asked the question, what if we actually constrain the space, the space of functions f to be from a much smaller space? You know? In fact, actually from a finite space, right? And what is that space, right? Let me show you that with an example. So here is actually a specification, and I made this example to be explicitly dead simple. The specification is a function foo, which takes an input x and just returns x plus x, right? Now, I want to now implement this, and, and this is actually from uh, 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 the work of uh, Bodik and Solar Lazama, and, and this is uh, uh, Solar Lazama's PhD thesis at Berkeley. Um, what he did was actually, you know, he one wants to implement this function, so this is a specification, and in, like what, what uh, uh, Church said, he wants to synthesize an implementation, but he doesn't want to synthesize any odd implementation. He gives you a lot of structure to this implementation, and he just puts a hole, right? He says, x left shifted by something, and now can an automated algorithm figure out what that thing is, right? And now you could imagine, actually, you know, if, if, this, if, these, uh, if this hole has to be filled by, say, you know, 16-bit numbers or 32-bit numbers, there is a finite state space that you search through to find you know, which number uh, would pr pr provide an equivalent program. And you know, in some sense, actually, you know, the, the, the specification, you know, from, uh, if you think about it in Church's formulation, is the, you know, y is such that y equals foo of x, where that's the relation. Right? That's actually given to you. And the implementation is you know, what, what would you substitute this, uh, this double question mark for? And actually, you know, you know, actually you know, if you left shift by 1, you should get that, and that is, 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 it's a simpler algorithmic problem. So you might think this is very trivial. I mean, I, I went from Buki and I showed you something really, really trivial. Let me show you, show, show you something a little bit more complicated. Um, <clears throat> and I, and instead, of, instead of specifications as programs, you could also write specifications as assertions. But let me show you something a little bit more complicated. And this one is actually from um, this, uh, this handbook, which is actually called Hacker's Delight. And it's actually quite delightful. I mean, if you're, if you're interested in solving bit manipulation and nerdy problems, if you want to give to your students, actually, you could look at it. So here, here's a problem from this hacker's delight, where you are given a bit vector as an input, a string. And what you have to do is that you have to generate a program which takes your input and um, resets the um, rightmost substring of contiguous ones to zero. So which means that, you know, here, the rightmost contiguous string is this one, we reset it to zero. Here, here's a one, we reset it to zero. Here, there's two ones, and we reset this to, uh, to zero. So that's actually the specification of the problem. And you, know, you could write that in logic, or you could actually just give that as examples. You could give three or four examples and say, this is what you want to do, right? But the question is, you now have to write this as a program where I just give you a set of operators. That's all that you're allowed to do. You're not allowed to write like a for loop and do something or the other, right? The question is actually, does such a program exist? Right? And this is quite similar to what I showed you here, right? I mean, here the answer was very obvious to you, right? And here probably the answer is actually not so obvious to you, 
right? But and then I'm, to make this state space finite, right, I could just say, you could use these, but maybe I'll allow you to construct an expression of depth only like five or six or something like that, but not more than that, right? So that means actually the set of all expressions you can write is actually bounded. And it actually turns out that, you know, and you can verify it, actually that, that expression, um, I can tell you, it actually does exactly that. Right? And you could actually build uh, a synthesis tool to actually do that. And several synthesis tools that are out there today can actually discover that solution. Right? So what's actually happening here? Right? What, what has happened here is that this is actually now you're actually fixing actually a, a space of programs. Right? It's actually called templates. I mean, in uh, uh, um, uh, Solar Lazama called this a sketching, like in the sense that you give a sketch of what a program should look like. And in some sense, a synthesis tool fills the holes uh, in the sketch. And um, this is actually equivalent to, you know, if you sort of think about it in the Boolean space, it is, it is equivalent to something called quantified Boolean formulas, which is actually, you know, um, one step more complicated than SAT solving, right? Where in some sense, actually, you know, instead of, instead of searching for f uh, in, in Church's formulation, such that for all x, um, phi x, f of x uh, satisfied, you have a template, right? And you know, f is actually, you know, in some sense, a higher order quantifier because actually you're searching through a space of functions, and you now enumerate these functions through a template, right? And you are actually looking for the total number of functions is finite, and there is some index i that actually, you know, indexes into those space of functions, and you can now write this as just a quantifier over, you know, primitive types. That right? you don't have to quantify over functions; you could actually quantify over, you know, booleans, integers, something like that. And actually, there's, there's a fixed template function, and this problem can be solved. I mean, this is still not quite sad. The reason why it's not quite sad is that there is an alternation of quantifiers here, right? You know, in, in the sense that if you want to think about it as a sad formula, you, you won't have a for all, right? You just, you just give you a formula and then ask, you know, does there exist um, a, a satisfying assignment? That's how you solve sad. And sad is empty complete, and it turns out that if you alternate quantifiers, you get something that's p-space complete. And, and you could actually solve it using something called iterated SAT solving. I mean, for those of you who are curious, right, the way you do this is that you, know, you blow out this quantifier by writing a few conjuncts. I mean, you don't write all x's, you write some x1, x2, x3, and then you find an i using a SAT solver. And then you flip the question and ask, does that i work for all x? That's another SAT solver question. And then you put an iteration here, and then you put them in a loop. That's how you solve it. And actually, that, that, this, was, you know, this procedure was discovered by uh, Solar Lazama in his thesis, and um, that's how he built. What is the discovery? Pardon? What is that word discovery? For some fixed template function t? Why it's fixed, right? What I mean is actually, what I mean here is actually, for example, you know, the template could be the set of all expression trees that you construct from these operators, right? So that actually you now fixes the structure of t rather than an unbounded space of functions, right? And that's actually quite crucial because you know the number of possible solutions to this is actually finite, right? Um, so, so the, you know, and 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 uh, as and um, the, the the second version of this you know came from my colleague Sumit Gurwani, who who works in Microsoft Research in Redmond, and he built actually something called Flash Fill. I don't know how many of you have used it. Can I show, can you show me a show of hands of how many of you used it? It's pretty fascinating actually. You know, I see some some of the people, and it's actually available in Excel. So, you, if you use Excel, what you could do is the following. Now, suppose there's a spreadsheet like this in which the first column is some uh, name, first name, there's a middle name, there's a last name, and, um, and you want to maybe uh, you know, create uh, a combined name that consists of last name, comma, first name, comma, middle initial, dot. Suppose you want to do something like that, and you want to do this for maybe a thousand names in the spreadsheet. right? You could actually write an Excel macro that does that, which is a program. But what Sumit did was actually he devised a system by which you could actually just teach the system using one or two examples. Instead of writing the macro, which is obviously you need to be an expert in doing Excel programming, you could just write this example, and then the system would automatically synthesize this program. Right? Which you believe me, you know, if you, if you provide, uh, then this, what this program can do is actually it can, it can fill every row, of, every row of this table with exactly what you needed to do. Right? But this problem is actually not at all very, any different from what Solar Lazama did, because you know, in some sense, the space of Excel macros is actually a finite state space if you constrain it, and he's actually, what Sumit is really doing is search, right? So in some sense, right? Um, and, and then, actually, you know, he did this for, for
for, 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 for Flashville, then uh, together with um, Polazo, he did something called Flash Meta, where going from, you know, the space of Excel macros is just one domain-specific language. He built a meta tool, which you don't only give the, you not only give the input out of examples, you also specify the language from which you need to search. Um, you can specify that as a grammar uh, with some semantics. And you also can specify certain search heuristics because typically the space of programs is, is still large, even though it may be finite, it's actually quite large. And, uh, and, and, and initially it was called Flash Meta and then they renamed it to Prose, right? And Prose is available open source. It's actually an amazing piece of work where you, know, you could actually just use it. You could actually take, you could write your own language of programs that you want to search over and you could give some examples and you could give some search heuristics and you, know, you could download it and use it and it does a pretty amazing job of actually searching through programs. But what has happened actually from you know, what, what uh, Church started was that you know, instead of this becoming this complex, non-elementary, you know, hard thinking problem, it has really became a search, search problem where actually you're now re restricting the, the set of programs that you want to synthesize from and then you know, the standard combinatorial uh, optimizations you can do to speed up the search is actually that this is how this game is actually now being played, right? Uh, now actually, you know, let me just now talk about something that, that I don't know much about. <laughs> and I, I'll talk about it anyway, which is supervised learning. If you think about it, right, what I, sh what I showed before is actually not much different from su supervised learning. What do, we, what do we do in supervised learning? In supervised learning, what we do is that, you know, you give a bunch of input-output training examples, and you have a learning algorithm which produces a model, and as a program language, this person, I look at it and say, it kind of looks like a program with quotes. Uh, that's, that's what a supervised learning algorithm uh, really does, right? So the simplest example of it is regression, where you know, maybe you have some data which shows, in this case, um, years of post-secondary education with a person's salary, right? And then you know, statisticians have uh, been long, long doing things like least squares. They can come up with um, solutions to, you know, you know, if you want to build, fit a straight line, AX plus B, you know, they can use you know, various techniques, maybe gradient descent, to come up with the best parameter values of A and B. It's been no, known for a long time. The new name for this is called artificial intelligence, but this has been, this has been known for a long time, right? That we, could do, we could do this. We've been, we know how to do this for a long, long time, right? right? Um, uh, you know, we, we could do this in multiple dimensions. You know, you, you, you don't have to have the, the input variables don't have to be, um, um, you know, one, you know, based on the size of the house and the number of bedrooms, if you want to predict the, the, the price of the house, we could fit, a, a, instead of a line, we could actually fit a plane uh, with, with more parameters to do that. Um, you know, here is actually something even more cool. We could build whole oh, deep neural networks where, you know, now the model is more complicated. Instead of learning, you know, two or three parameters, we could build this network uh, with non-linearities at every level, but you know, still we learn parameters. We learn parameters at every level um, uh, using um, essentially you know, gradient descent. There are efficient ways to do that, like backprop. But what are you really doing finally is actually you're learning parameters to, in some sense, uh, discover a, a model in which I could you know, think about as a program, right? Um, so what has happened here, right? What has happened here is that, uh, so the, the way I sort of think about program synthesis is that you, you can do specifications using logical formulas. You can also do it using examples, but typically you convert the examples also to formulas. That's how you sort of think about it. And typically you supply a small number of examples, like what, you, what, I, what I showed you in Sumit's case, and then you constrain the space of programs that you want to generate or search for using a domain-specific language, and your search algorithm is typically a combinatorial search, right? And then you try and, try and generate a program which satisfies the specification, and usually many, many programs satisfy the specification, and you have to figure out how to rank them. I mean, that's not a problem. And, and in machine learning, and at least in supervised learning, what you have is a, you have much more huge amounts of training data. That's, that's one difference. And the second one is actually, you know, you typically, you don't have a specification, you typically have a loss function. You have a loss function, you know, you, you, want, you, want to, you want to write the characteristic of what you want to generate using a loss that you want to optimize, right? And then you typically, write this as a continuous function and do optimization, most, most commonly using gradient descent. That's what you do. And, and then the output is a function which minimizes the loss. Right? You choose parameters that minimizes the loss. Um, so you can sort of see uh, parallels uh, between these two things. In addition to you know, the small number of examples versus large number of examples, right? another thing that 
you see in practice is that the kind of programs that you generate uh, from program synthesis are typically very interpretable. Interpretable in the sense that, I mean, they are, they are going to be in whatever language you want the tool to generate, right? So you could actually see them, and you could see what they did. They look like a program to you. And, uh, but one difficulty that these kinds of techniques have is actually they have difficulty handling noise. You know, in the sense that they try and fit your specification like plumb, right? So if you sort of perturb your input, or if your input has noise, so these kind of techniques don't tend to work very well, right? So they don't have probability inside them. So those are all, you know, they're the nature of the beast. That's, that's how these things work. But in this case here, right, these kinds of things are much more robust to noise. So instead of giving an input data at one point, you could actually perturb it, and as long as you give enough number of them, you know, these things will learn parameters that maximize average loss or aggregate loss or something like that. So these things tend to be far more robust, right? And actually, but, but the flip side is that actually the, the ones that work really well, things like DNNs and so on, I mean, you could write them together as a function, but if you ask me, you know, what does it mean, it's actually, it's very, very hard to actually understand actually what they mean. So right? those are sort of the dual characteristic of these kinds of things, right? So that's sort of my, you know, uh, in a programming language, this person's one-on-one -on -one introduction to, to, uh, uh, um, to machine learning. But let me now go here, which actually, you know, is what I've been working on for about a year, a year and a half now. And this is a problem that, um, let, me, let me tell you what motivated to look at this problem. There's a problem called heterogeneous data extraction, where you know, I, I, as I go through it, it'll be clear why um, combining program systems and machine learning actually makes sense, right? And, and I'll motivate that. Um, and this is collaboration with um, my colleagues, uh, Arun Ayer uh, and Suresh Pat Sardi in Microsoft Research India. And Arjun Radhakrishna actually is in Sumit Gulwani's team in Redmond. And Manohar was a visitor. I mean, he was a, he's a postdoc. Uh, he finished his PhD at EPFL, and he visited me for about a year, um, a year and a half, I think. So, so, so you know, and this is ongoing work. I mean, we, we just have a draft that we have written up. So I have, you know, I've made, I have gathered the courage to present ongoing work here. That's, that's where I am, yeah. So what is the problem? The problem is, uh, you know, you want to extract structured attributes uh, from heterogeneous unstructured or semi-structured data. And this is a, very, it's a very important problem, right? You know, it's a problem where, you know, you, you, wanna, you wanna process websites, you know, in domains such as travel, shopping, and you wanna extract attributes from them. Uh, you know, you get, you get airline emails, and then from that you wanna, de 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 you know, extract some structure. Uh, you know, Sumit uses the term data wrangling. Uh, there are many, many applications, right? Let me, let me tell, show you what, what data sets motivate in me. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I was visiting Ashoka University. And in Ashoka University, there is actually a center called Trivedi Center for Political Data. Right? It is run by um, Sudhindra Hangal and, and Jeev. Um, uh, they showed me this data that it's actually publicly available data that you know, the government puts out on uh, candidates who have stood in elections, Lok Sabha elections all over India for the past 10, 15 years. They have actually collected the data from various places. And each of those data sets look like this. You know, the first one is, you know, some guy, you know, this, the, the red thing is his father's name, um, you know, the, the, the green thing there is his date of birth, and this is where he was born. And look at that, right? Now, here is another entry, right? Um, that one says father's name. This one says it's son of. Right? It's the same information, but it is sort of present slightly in a different way, right? And these guys have, you know, thousands and thousands of these records. And one of the first things that they have to do in order to do data analysis is that they wanted to convert all of this into, into spreadsheet, right? So they wanna have a column, name of the candidate, father's name, you know, date of birth. And they wanna, and, and uh, Sudhindra told me that, I, so you know, he, he said that'll be super useful for me to do analytics. And the way he does that today is that he, uh, they teach a, a course to the undergrads and they give homework to their students to uh, extract 10 of them uh, every week. <laughs> Right? This is what he told me. So I told him, you know, hey, but do you know, you know, Sumit Gulwani's work, we have this tool called Pros, and he said, I've tried it. It's just very hard. I challenge you to make this work for this data set. <laughs> so actually, that actually, you know, is a, to a programming language person is, is, a, is an insult to one's ego. So I said, actually, you know, I mean, I, we should be able to do it, man. I mean, what, what the hell is this? So I came back, and then Manohar had just uh, joined as a postdoc. He asked me what the hell I should do. I said, Manohar, I'll give you a data set. Let's see, actually, if, uh, you know, Pros works on this, right? And then I found, actually, it actually doesn't work, and I'll tell you why it doesn't work. The reason why it doesn't work is that, you see, the thing is that this, this kind of data is actually very, very heterogeneous, right? It has lots, if you sort of think about in terms of clusters, right, it has lots and lots of clusters, and what I found was actually PROS really works for one cluster at a time, right? But the variants are there, and you know, 
the number of clusters is very large and you have to, in some sense, intuitively, what made, became very clear to us is that we somehow we need to generate one program per cluster. That's what you have to do, right? But you know, it's not even clear what, how, to, how to define the distance metric to even group these things into clusters. It was very, very unclear how to do something like that, right? So that was one, right? And then Manohar and I were just going on in our own merry ways doing this. And then I realized actually that two other, two other colleagues of mine, and Arun Ayer and Suresh Patase, were actually working on a different problem. The different problem is, you know, you get, you get uh, when you get emails on, <clears throat> um, you know, things like airline, you know, when you, when, you, when, you, when you travel, you get, in the airline company sends you an email saying, actually, here's your flight, uh, uh, yada, yada. And then from that, actually, I don't know whether your phone does it, you know, the, my phone extracts this, and it actually shows it to you as a task card that you could click on to check in, right? How, how many of you have this facility on your phone? Just raise your hand. Right? So most of you do that, right? Like for example, you know, if you pull up my phone, my flight tomorrow is actually there, right? But you sort of think about it, how does it happen, right? What, what Arun and Suresh were doing is actually they were working with a product team that has actually built this for Microsoft. What they do is that they write a script that you know, recognizes, oh, this is an airline mail, and then they extract you know, what the name of the person is, what the flight is, what the departure time is, and they put that, put that right? And it turns out that this is the same problem as the political data set problem. Because actually each airline has a different format, right? And, but you somehow want to extract, you know, just like in the political data set, you need to extract the name of the politician, you know, their, their date of birth and where they was born. You have to do the same thing right here. And unlike the political data set, right, uh, you know, th th these people at Microsoft, you know, they have far more funds, so they don't actually ask a student to extract one at a time. They actually employ programmers, right? And what they, what they do, is let me show you what they do. What they do is that they cluster the inputs themselves by some means or the other. And then they learn an extraction script per cluster. And that's what they do, right? For example, right, you know, this you can't see, but this is, you know, how those airline emails look if you look, look at them as HTML. And, you know, you know maybe Alaska Airlines sends, sends you these emails, and, you know, in, uh, 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 to, to, in order to find your booking reference, which is this PNR number, it's always present in the, in the a span tag of this, this color, then you know, this, this the extraction tool they are recognizing, it matches that pattern, and it actually says, you know, look inside this pan color, blah. And you know, whatever is there is, in, is the airline reference number. This is basically what actually you know, the product group is actually doing, which seems uh, uh, you know, kind of low tech, but this is what they do. But then actually what happens is that you know, some, this airline hires a new programmer, they just change the name or the, change the color, and send you a different email, then your script doesn't work anymore, right? Then they run around in circles, and then they run this tool again, and then it produces a different script, right? The, yeah, go ahead, yeah. But why is it the color? Why not just take the Yeah, yeah, but this is the, that reason is that actually, you know, there are, they, there's a tool which does it. I mean, they, they're not doing it uh, manually, unlike the, uh, the students, right? So what they do is actually, they, they, for example, there's a tool called Rapstar, to which you could actually give a set of labeled examples, and it will generate something, right? And, and you, you, know, you and I don't like uh, color, but actually the tool doesn't know the semantics of that, so it just generates it, right? Uh, because the tool just, you know, it just recognizes in the DOM structure what is the commonality behind, you know, five or six labeled annotations that you gave, and that's what it's going to do, right? Yeah. Why it's not used for the name that Typically, it's not even there, right? It, you know, it's, see, basically, what happens is the following, right? This, this name is actually there in some database. And then somebody has just written a display script to print it in some you know, tabular format with nice color or something like that, and they do whatever they do, right? So, and, and this problem, by the way, is not, you know, it's not something, it's, it's known for a long time, right? But this is what they do. But the problem they have, and the nice thing, I, I asked them, right, what, what is this, man? I thought, you know, you're like, AI, ML is going on. Why are you just generating the script like this, right? They told me that one of the reasons why they're doing this is that at least they know what the script looks like. If it doesn't work, right, they can go debug it. And they, they, people told me that it's so important for them uh, to be able to do that. But this thing is extremely brittle, right? If they the color changes, uh, it, it could be a problem. The other problem they have is actually, you know, they generate these kinds of templates for different airlines. After clustering, they generate one template for each airline, right? Tomorrow, you know, Vistara airline comes up and a new email comes, I think then more people run around in circles to generate that also. So basically, that's, that's, how, this, this how, that's how the system works, right? And it requires labels per template, uh, increasing investment in, you know, human annotation. So 
in some sense, actually, you know, at this point, actually, <laughs> Manohar and I, and we, we decided to join forces with, uh, with, with Suresh and Arun, and we actually had some formulation of what we really wanted to do. Um, it made sense, actually, to combine machine learning and program synthesis, because in some sense, right, what machine learning models can do is that you can sort of train in one format and guess what you want from other formats, right? So, you know, unlike the rap star, where, you know, they learn things like, you know, blue color, you know, we can actually give machine learning models, you know, this is how the annotation sort of looks like with Alaska Airlines, and here's the, how the annotation sort of looks like with, you know, Jet Airways. And we can actually build models that can learn from, you know, one cluster and actually transfer knowledge to another one. That's actually really one of the real powers that machine learning has. But the advantage that programming languages have is actually the scripts are inter interpretable. We actually know what they're doing. Uh, but in some sense, right, we really need separate data for each training format. They're not adaptive. They're not robust. You know, they might, you know, figure out incidental things about the data and actually formats change. They are less robust and so on. So it made actually sense to combine these kinds of things, right? So, so how did we combine them? So the current way in which we're combining them, uh, you know, let me just give you, before I give you the technique, right, let me give you a little bit, you know, formal definition of this problem now. Formal definition of the problem is that you're given a data set D. And pardon a little bit of notation here, but I need this in order to precisely describe what I'm doing, right? So the, you're given a data set D, and you are given a, a partition, uh, F0 through Fn. You sort of think about them as partitioning this data into equivalence classes. F0 is one class, F1 is equal, one class, and so on. But the thing is, actually, I don't know what the equivalence class is. The equivalence class are there, but they're not given to me. So maybe God knows about it, but I don't, right? And then what you want to do is that you have to extract, you have to, you have to synthesize a field, which is a partial function um, that maps uh, these inputs into field values. And you know, you have to do it for many fields. You have to do it for you know, a name, you have to do it for PNR number, but I'll just focus on one. And then I have to do it for everything separately. So I need to come up with one extraction function f, which looks at this data d and then extracts a field of some type T, right? That's basically what I want to do. And the assumption I'm going to make is that in each cluster, the field is either defined for all inputs or not defined for all inputs. So either in a cluster, PNR number is there or not there. That's actually going to be a property of all of the data in the cluster. That's actually, that well-formedness of the data is actually very, very crucial to the way we're going to think about this problem. So that's an assumption we're going to make about this data, right? Um, and so, you know, one field could be flight number, another field could be airport and so on, that's what this is. And so what are you given? So that's basically what you want to do. What you're given in addition to the data is the initial sort of training inputs. That's what you're given. You are given a, a DTR, which is a subset of D, which is annotated by humans. And this DTR could be across clusters, right? We don't, because I don't even know the clustering structure. So, uh, you know, you could give two inputs from Vistara Airlines, you could give three inputs from Indigo Airlines, all good. So that's, that's what you're given. Maybe, you know, the, the training data is typically maybe 0.01% of the actual data that you have. It's actually that small, right? Because the number of emails you get is actually really, really large, right? So in addition, actually, you know, you, after we worked on this for a while, we decided that actually we, we can benefit by actually asking a programmer what is called a constraint. A constraint is actually much like, you know, a type specification, right? If you actually have to generate a date of birth, right? As me as a programming language person can actually write a type specification for how a date of birth should, date of birth should look like. Right? If you give me something, if you give me something, I can tell you whether it looks like a date of birth or not. And I can write uh, a type for it, or I can write a first order logic formula to actually describe, you know, what um, uh, a, a date looks like. But it for, so it turns out, right? So initially, we said actually this, if, you know, a constraint which is actually certifies whether it, whether an output looks good or not. We initially made this a function from the output value t to true or false. But for various reasons, you know, it's actually advantageous to also consider the input, and I'll, I'll show you why. So, but, but this one is actually, you know, some a programming language person's view of thinking about, if you give me an output, I can actually just certify whether the output looks good or doesn't look good. And that's actually extra information to me than just giving examples, right? And then we assume that if we have access to an annotation oracle, which is a human, to whom I can actually give, okay, give me an annotate data for this input as well, an additional input, and I can actually do it. And the goal is to synthesize or learn an extraction function uh, which maximizes some performance metrics, and I'll define what they are with minimal human intervention or minimal, you know, oracle uh, invocations. Actually, that's that's what what's what we want to do. And uh, uh, so I said something about field constraints. And the reason why we decided to make the field constraints also take input into account is that you know several of these, uh, 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 you know, this is this is a good example, right? Uh, uh, you know, the, the the father's name field. Uh, if you want to write a a a, a field constraint on it. 
uh, you know, Malhar wrote, um, uh, uh, you know, something that, you know, looks at our Bing logs, and he came up with a database of common Indian names. And then he actually checks, you know, using a method whether if the, the name that you get is actually an Indian name or not. That's essentially what we do. But the reason why we also want to take the input is that substrings of the Indian name also look like an Indian name, right? You know, you can actually just take, you know, uh, you could drop Raja Mani and then Sriram will stu still pass the test, right? And if you want a data set, right, you want to extract Sriram Raja Mani, you just don't want to extract Sriram, right? So we, we wrote this constraint in such a way that, you know, the, the value T passes my test and no super string of it actually passes the test because that's actually the correct answer. So for, as a result, right, the constraints actually make sense to actually also take the input to actually write them. So that's actually a decision we did. So now this is, this is all there is. I mean, I think, you know, we have, we have inputs, we have these constraints. The other training, training knob we have is that we can actually tweak the domain-specific language, which is the language of programs that the synthesizer is actually going to do. So those are the input knobs that we're going to give to the system. And here is the system we designed. Uh, it's actually called a heterogeneous data extraction framework. What it does actually, it, it has machine learning components and it also has programming language synthesis components. Uh, what it does is actually it takes, uh, uh, you know, annotated inputs and it first works by training a machine learning model using the annotated inputs. And you do, you can actually get a machine learning model, but the real difficulty is that the labels are actually are noisy, right? You have, you have noise and you don't, you don't have a good way of managing the noise, right? So what we are next going to do is actually we're going to take these noisy labels and then we are going to put this in the, inside this program synthesis box. And this is not the traditional program synthesis box. It's actually a tweaked program synthesis box because program synthesis as it is actually does not know how to deal with noisy inputs. That's actually something that we mentioned. So we are going to come up with you know, a, di a different contraption there to actually how to deal with um, uh, labels with noise. And it turns out that it actually because this input is not homogeneous, we are not going to output one program but we're gonna output what is called a disjunctive programs, which is a, you could sort of think about it as a set of programs, intuitively one per cluster. That's what uh, this, this program synthesis engine is actually gonna generate. And then we're gonna have a way by which, once you generate the program, now I have actually two solutions to this problem. I have a machine learning solution, I also have a program synthesis solution. One looks like this, you know, DNN or conditional random field or whatever. I also have the scripts. Now I can actually do very interesting things like voting and other kinds of things to actually boost which labels I have more confidence in and which labels I have less confidence in, I can actually figure out which cases the two of them differ the most and use that to actually do active learning. I mean, those are the cases where actually I'm going to ask the user. So I can actually have a way to actually feed these things back and put these together. And you know, we thought, we, and at some point we, draw, we drew this on our whiteboard and say, maybe we should build this. The question is actually, will this amplify the noise and make this system un unusable? Or actually, will, will this uh, crunch the noise and make this usable? I mean, the fact that I'm giving this talk makes it's probably because actually there are, there are many situations under which the noise can actually be crunched. And uh, so that's the story uh, I'll talk about, yeah? Right, so, so you know, one more tutorial introduction. Um, again, actually, you know, uh, uh, please excuse me if you are a machine learning person. Now, I, as a programming languages person, I'll describe what a conditional random field is, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, but if, even if you don't, you should be able to understand it. It's not very hard to understand. See, a conditional random field is a machine learning model, and what a conditional random field does is that it's a sequence model, and you know, if you're given this input, uh, which, is a, which is a string from the political data, database, you want to generate an annotation, which is a, a label for every token uh, in your word. And uh, what, is, what does a conditional random field do? Uh, what a conditional random field does is actually, you know, in some sense, actually, it comes up with a probabilistic model that generates the most likely uh, solution to this problem. And the way that you do it is actually first train it. You train it by First, you know, take, taking some training data, and using the training data, you, um, you, you learn uh, this function. Uh, the, you, you learn this parameters lambda, uh, where you know, S is the input string, L is the, uh, uh, is the score for that input string, and uh, you have a bunch of features. The features, um, you know, could mostly they, they cover adjacent uh, uh, tokens. You know, it says things like, you know, if the previous uh, token is key of father's name, the next token is likely to be value of father's name. So, you know, that's actually what a feature is saying, and then you collect a bunch of such features. You know, I think people who do computer vision, you know, image segmentation is actually very, very similar, right? So you, you do that and you learn the, the weights, weights lambda, and once you learn the weights lambda using training, and typically you probably do that using gradient descent, then, you know, you can actually in, do inference by, you know, suppose I give you a new sequence, I can actually show you um, the highly likely label, 
right? Um, there's a more complicated one for which I don't write the math because the math won't fit in a slide. Uh, it's, it's actually called an LSTM. Uh, oh, no, no, before, before, maybe actually do, I don't even have the, oh, wait, it's here. There's something called an LSTM CRF. It turns out that, you know, by powering it up, you can actually solve additional problems better. But if you don't know what this is, don't worry about it because I actually don't know what this is either. I mean, Arun knows what this is, so he uses it. Yeah. It's used actually in natural language processing, but you could sort of think about it as a black box where, you know, you could sort of throw training data and actually build a model for itself, right? But, but what, what do these things really do? What, what these things really do is that given a small amount of training data, they learn a model uh, such that model M, and which in my mind is a program, where, you know, M of I for any input is now in some sense a noisy label for, for the input I, right? I mean, I, the, the real problem I have with it is actually I don't, I don't trust when it is correct and when I, I don't know when it is actually not right. That's really the only problem with it. Otherwise, it looks pretty, pretty good, right? And it's, it's not interpretable, and actually the noise, noise is hard to manage, right? And, you know, there, here's some you know, actual data about, you know, what you could generate, what its precision is, and so on. Uh, but, but those are the uh, two, two, main, uh, two main points, right? So now here is the crucial step of what we do, right? We take that uh, noisy input, and we have a, in a very interesting variant of a synthesis algorithm that's able, actually able to take the noisy inputs and, and generate an output. And what we do is that we use process a black box and we do something around it. So what we do is actually imagine, but the good thing is actually, you know, the, let me just tell you something about the scale of things here. Typically the training data could be 1%, 0.1% of actually your total data set. You could actually now learn a machine learning model which will give you some answer actually on the entire data set. But you know, what you don't know is actually what is the confidence, that's what you don't know, right? So, but what you can do is actually, you can actually generate now a label for everything. And that's actually something. So what you now do is that, you what we do is actually we sample from the data. What you do is actually, you, know, you, uh, you, you sample a small number of samples from the learned data, which is actually doing inference. You, know, you just pick three rows and learn you know, what, which the father's name tags are. And you do lots and lots of such samples, thousands of them, 10,000s of them. And for every one of them, you give them to a program synthesis tool and you learn a script, right? Then you have lots and lots of programs by doing this process. You, maybe you generate 10,000 programs. Then what you do is that you now generate a cover from those programs that cover the entire data set, right? So basically what you do is that you but for that, actually, you need to have a criterion for actually when a program is actually doing something correct, right? And you do that by an objective function that weights both what the machine learning model gives and whether the model satisfies a constraint, which is actually the declarative specification that you wrote. Right? Whether something looks like a father's name or something that looks like a date, you have some, you know, you have some other some other extraneous way of actually giving a vote on whether actually what, what, it, what the program generates actually is correct or not, right? Using this, you actually, you give, you give weights to the programs, and then you find a small number of programs that produce quote unquote correct outputs for your entire data set from the tens and thousands of programs you generate, right? And you try and generate a cover with a small number of programs, right? And what we find actually, and then we are actually trying to write some theorems about it, is that because of Occam's razor, a small number of programs that cover a large number of inputs actually turn out to be really good programs, which is really you know, the insight that, that we have in here. And um, uh, that, that, yeah, that's the crux of what we do. And uh, you know, in some sense, from a, no from a noisy set of labels produced by the ML model, we can produce a disjunctive program. Um, and in, in, in interestingly, what we find is actually each disjunct, in some sense, implicitly now defines a cluster, which is actually the, for the set of inputs for, actually, for which it actually works. Right? In some sense, the programs now induce the cluster rather than the clusters inducing the program, which I found very fascinating. Right? Um, um, and here are some examples of uh, you know, specific situations in the data set um, you know, where what is the kind of programs we generate using the sampling and, 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 the, and, and, this, and, this, and discovery. Right? Then what we do is actually now we have two representations of the program, which is of, of the program that you want to generate. One is actually generated by these machine learning models and one that is generated by the set cover, right? And then we actually essentially use both of these to tune the confidence that we have on the weights. If they agree, we are gonna boost it. Um, if they don't agree, then actually we are just gonna ask the user, right? And we have a, we have a semi automated loop which actually changes your annotations. And then you just read on it. This is essentially our system. 
And um, yeah, if, if the, and actually also we can rank the programs. When one strategy that we find is actually the program is ranked very high, you know, maybe we are PL megalomaniacs. We just say the program output wins, and we just discard uh, what, what the machine model is saying, machine learning model is saying. And then in cases we ask um, disagreement from the user, and then we retrain the model. And then we have stats where, in every iteration, we know we have measured, uh, you know, how the precision and recall of the system. And, I, and I'll show you some graphs of actually how they change. And, and we find that if you carefully tune, I mean, the number one lesson that we learned is actually with carefully tuned constraints and carefully tuned domain-specific language, you can actually get this noise to actually iteratively just crunch down. Um, um, that is one of the learnings uh, that we have. Um, and, and for that, actually, I'll just I'll show you some results. But before I do that, let me let me. I mean, I mean, I've been talking about metrics. Let me just formally define uh, what metrics we are using. Uh, we use the precision and recall. But let me just define formally what those are. Uh, there is some ground truth F, which is the perfect extractor that we want to extract. We don't know what it is. The system extracts a possible extractor F star using this iterative loop. And um, we have two metrics, precision and recall. Precision has the denominator, the number of cases for which the extracted function produces some sensible value, which is not bottom. And among those, which is the denominator, how many of those agrees with the actual function? Right? That you have to do with a, with a manual test. You, know, you have to show a bunch of those to programmers and then see what's the actual value, uh, which is your you know, cross-validation set, and then figure out what this metric is. And, and recall is the same thing, but with the denominator is actually the actual one, which how many of those actually, how many of the actual extractions do you act does your um, synthesized function actually get? And then the, typically people use something called a F1 score, which is a weighted combination. Uh, I guess it's inverted geometric mean of, uh, of those two. And, and here are results, right? What we found was that, and we did this experiments over huge, huge amounts of data. We, and we did this over these, both these data sets, the political data set, as well as the airline um, travel data set. And we find that, and, and we extracted for um, various fields. And we find that in 24 out of 30 cases, right, we get this property that uh, the precision and recall numbers just improve in every iteration. And then we get significantly high uh, 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 precision recall numbers. Uh, th this is exactly roughly where we are. The other thing we did was we studied how the system works if we tweak the domain-specific language better. Like, for example, the question that you asked, right? I mean, how, how did you generate color? Why would you generate the program, right? I can write a domain-specific language in which you cannot even state such a program, right? You, that you can actually constrain this domain-specific language to be the kind of, kind of programs that you expect to generate. And when we do that, right, what happens is that you know, for example, this is actually, FE is actually flash extracts language which is token based. It can generate any program. And LT is a very domain specific language that we designed, which we think characterizes the kind of program that we want to generate, right? And if you go here, you find that the precision improves. And left side versus right side is actually no uh, constraint versus constraint, which is actually, you know, my understanding of what a father's name looks like, right? And when we do, when we give these extra pieces of information, right? we are actually able to get significant uh, precision and recall. And to me, you know, I sort of think about this as domain knowledge I can actually, these are ways by which I can, I, I can give domain knowledge to a system, which I think is very crucial to what machine, lang machine learning people also uh, want to do. They want to somehow encode domain knowledge in the system, and this could be one way of actually doing that, right? And you know, there are cases where this does not work, and I can actually talk to you about them, and there are cases where the noise actually amplifies. And I, I have some understanding of when these things happen, and we are studying about ways by which uh, we can fix them. But what I also find very surprising was that the groups that actually do this, even though our results are very early, they are showing great eagerness in actually incorporating that into their product and so on. That's actually another engagement um, that we're doing. And we wrote a paper which is under submission. And I, I, could, I could give you a, 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 a preprint or, or a draft, if you like. Um, so that's actually my second, second part of my talk, and I think in the next five or 10 minutes, let me actually show you other you know, opportunities that actually I've seen other people doing uh, in ideas that actually combine uh, this kind of information. I'll, I'll go through about three or four. Uh, there's actually a, a, a huge amount of work that is going on in this space. I picked like three or four which I found um, sufficiently different and sufficiently interesting to give you a flavor of the kind of things that people do. The first one is actually something that two of my colleagues have been doing at MSR India. Uh, Pratik Jain and um, uh, Nagaraj and Natrajan. Actually, they have been independently working with Sumit Gulwani. And what they're doing is that they are using machine learning to both prune the search space that 
prose is searching. Right? What prose is doing is actually, once you give it inputs and outputs, right, it's actually searching through this huge space of programs by, in some sense, enumerating all the programs that we generated from the grammar. Right? So you sort of think about you know, something that gives you a, a context-free grammar and keeps generating strings, because each string that you generate is a program. And then it actually checks whether the program satisfies the specification. That's a very you know, 101 broad brush way of describing what Prose is doing. Right? But what you could do is actually you could, you could use machine learning to figure out that if you take this production, it's unlikely that you're going to generate a program. You, would actually, you can actually rank which production you should pick to generate the program. Right? And you can use this to actually rank the order in which you actually search through the search space. You can actually also figure out which search space you can actually prune by computing a scoring function on whether the subspace is actually even likely to give you actually a program. And it turns out that those things work incredibly well. And there's a paper by uh, these guys in ICLR which actually shows how effective that is. The other thing that they do is once you generate a program, typically, you know, because in these kinds of situations, you specify only one or two inputs, that these things are grossly underspecified, which means there's lots and lots of programs that will satisfy um, uh, you know, your, your constraints, and you can actually rank them. And, and there's a paper that these guys are writing which shows actually how you can rank them using you know, traditional machine learning methods. Separately, there is a bunch of absolutely fascinating papers that we have been reading from our competitors, mainly, uh, where there is actually something called neural program induction, where given, instead of giving small number of input output examples, they can generate lots and lots of input output examples, and they actually they have something called neural programming where the, the, the neural network actually just generates a program as an output. Um, and, and you know, uh, in some sense, right, the difference between this one and this previous line of work is that this one is mainly search-based. And the neural network is actually used to guide that search, right? This one seems far more uncontrolled to me, right? And I don't understand what this is doing as much, but actually that may be my training rather than something fundamental about this approach, right? <clears throat> the final thing I'll, I'll note is actually another thing that I found very fascinating, which is if you look at actually deep neural networks today and the frameworks that are actually used to support them, you know, be it TensorFlow, PyTorch, Cafe, all of these kinds of things, they describe neural networks as programs, right? Various stages actually are written down as programs, right? And uh, in order to do gradient descent, they have to actually calculate these gradients. I mean, you have to do differentiation in order to do calculate these gradients, right? And these frameworks have to work for any program that a user writes using them, right? And for a particular program, you could actually write on a whiteboard what the gradient is, but it has to work for a combination of a convolution layer and you know, this layer and that layer, I should be able to string them together and I should now be able to automatically figure out what the derivative for that is. And that's actually an absolutely fascinating area and in both the functional programming community and the programming languages community in large, there is actually lots of interesting work that is going on in actually how to do this automatic differentiation, right? And it's very non-trivial to do it very effectively and locally. And if you're interested in this space, actually, that's another. And this particular, this particular paper is actually really cool. I mean, I recommend reading it um, if you're interested in this topic. And so, you know, that's sort of my <laughs> a short summary. Uh, you know, I think uh, bo bo those of us in formal methods, right? Uh, uh, you know, we, we have all read this papers in our grad school and largely dismissed it as, dismissed it off as impractical, right? And I think, and um, uh, 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 Solar Nazama's work and uh, Sumit Gulwani's work have really uh, breathed freshness into this area by constraining the programs that you search for to be finite but large state spaces. And I think they are uh, far more practical. And you already see several interesting applications of this in domains like flash, flash fill, but I think the area of challenges remain because the kinds of things that these um, uh, synthesis tools generate tend to be rather homogenous. If your data set is homogenous, they actually work very well. But if your data set is heterogeneous, if your labels are noise, there are many, many um, unsolved problems. And I think this is not the only place where actually you can combine ideas from those. I showed you several more, uh, things like neural program induction, automatic differentiation. And uh, this is an area which, if you're interested, like me in programming languages and you're wondering what the hell is machine learning, uh, you know, I think this, this could give you a way uh, to understand uh, the space through your terms. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.
we are a startup company and then we work on feminine cancer as I discussed with you over tea uh, or <laughs> coffee or break. <coughs> Uh, ours is on image segmentation, and which is not so heterogeneous, where we have for the early diagnosis of breast cancer or cervical cancer with the uh, X-ray data. That's it's a, a pixel. So how about that machine language? Because currently in Netherlands, they are working on artificial intelligence that's to do with machine language, and then on the early diagnosis. Because yeah. as we have proved, early diagnosis is 89% curable of breast cancer. Okay. Thank you. So, so I, one thing I will say is the following, right? One thing I will say is that we started working on this with text. And some people have asked me, right, you know, will this work with, you know, images? I, I have no idea, right? I do, I do know that, you know, that we've been actually talking with Monaji Chowdhury, who's in our lab, about natural language processing. And if you look at natural language processing, right, um, they actually also, I mean, I think everybody transitioned from rule-based techniques to, you know, this, uh, this DNN wave that is actually hitting us. You know, they've actually used uh, rule-based techniques for part of, parts of speech tagging, and so on, and now there is DNN-based techniques, and uh, neither one actually works perfectly well, right? So there's a, there's a conversation we're having with them to see whether we can combine these rule-based things that they have with um, uh, probabilistic techniques. Uh, so I, there's, there's, I think, more to be explored, but I have no idea, I mean, images, I have no idea, yeah. It's a yeah. very interesting piece of work. Yeah. I got excited after hearing this. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you would take me to the result slide. Yeah. Two, three slides before. This one, yeah, here. yeah. Uh, so I was wondering whether you performed a K-fold cross validation. Yeah, yeah so basically, you know, there was a you know, the whole thing was done by standard machine learning practices. You know, we had a, we have a training set, we we have a test set, and we do cross validation by you know changing them around. You know, whatever ML people do. Uh, okay, that's what we did. Yeah. So then the following question is: yeah. Have you performed statistical uh, test of significance? to be able to say categorically that the program synthesis indeed outperforms machine learning. Yeah, I think there is p-value calculations that are also done. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. And the third question, it's not a question, maybe a kind of remark or a suggestion. You said you were pruned the search space. Mm -hmm. Maybe evolution computing can be helpful there. Yeah, I think, you know, this one, there's lots and lots of people who are doing things like because this. Because it becomes a combinator your search problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there's many, many ways to do this. I mean, there's people who use genetic algorithms to do this. There's just a huge, huge, huge amount of space here. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So in your approach, you are directly synthesizing a concrete program, right? Mm -hmm. So does it make sense to synthesize an abstract program and then refine it into, so will it help? Yeah, I actually, you know, maybe, you know, we, uh, one of the things I must say is actually, you know, we were, we were very focused on getting this uh, political data set okay. and this, uh, this airline thing to work. I am actually, you know, I, I met um, uh, Sudhindra Hangal a couple of months ago and I had promised him that I'll give him something okay. to, you know, so that, uh, you know, I, I meet the challenge that he gave me. So my, my goal is to first give it to them and then we talk about other things, yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you for the talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, so I've been interested in semi-supervised learning and I, uh, from what I understood, you use very few constraints in order to guide the clustering and, and the search, right? So I, I was uh, wondering if you could comment on uh, what proportions of data was used for, uh, you know, for, for providing these constraints and, and then the, how big was the test set? So the constraints were all written manually, right? They were just, you know, us just talking about looking at some data and then, you know, just deciding what outputs we consider as reasonable and what outputs we don't consider as reasonable and all the constraints were just written manually, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm talking about how, how many constraints, like what? So we wrote one constraint per field. I see. But basically, so basically the way, the way we built the system is actually we, we have this separate loop going on. I, actually, when we implement, we try and do all of them together as well. But conceptually, is actually we are doing one such exercise for every field. And we have one such constraint for every type that we extract. For name, we have a constraint. For date, we have a constraint. For time, we have a constraint. Yeah. Th think about it as a type. That's what we do. Yeah. So uh, one more follow-up question. Yeah. So, um, so this work that you uh, uh, briefly talked about uh, from Pratik and Hana Natarajan, yeah. so is this uh, still towards uh, you know, smarter ways of searching the uh, program space or, or yeah. actually it's I mean, do you envision it as actually going all out and since Yeah, so basically, right, you know, this one actually, you know, I think this one is more wild because they don't have actually a predefined template. Unlike pros, right, they don't constrain the DSL that they generate, right? Which is why I think there's some people who like this kind of work where actually we generate a program and there are people who just say, you know, I can generate sorting algorithms. They, people are generating all kinds of programs. Yeah. But I, I, understand, I understand the space less. The other one, I at least understand what's going on. 
talked about using deductive logic to reduce the search space. Does it reduce finally the amount of data required for training in ML? Yeah, so all, all of this, right, <clears throat> both, you know, if you look at actually Sumit, uh, uh, Naga, and Pratik's work, they use the same amount of data, right? So actually, the, the correct way to describe this is that PROS itself has had a lot of hand tuning in order for it to actually work, right? There is, you know, if you look at actually, you know, my, uh, my uh, original introduction to PROS, right? You know, in, in, a, in addition to the, um, <clears throat> in addition to um, uh, the data, and the um, uh, 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 and the uh, space of programs, right? You have to give these witness functions, ranking heuristics, and so on. Otherwise, this process, you know, if you have a really com complex data, process it doesn't work. So a lot of the tuning the pros team does actually is to do this for every domain-specific language, right? I think what uh, Naga and uh, Pratik are able to do is that they have just been able to remove most of these kinds of things and use past programs, and they can actually learn them. So we, we have not actually focused as much on actually lowering the training data, but instead actually reducing the amount of tuning that PROS has to do when they go to a new domain-specific language. Uh, that's my understanding of what uh, Naga and Pratika are doing. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk again. Uh, a broader uh, question probably related to one of the bullets that you had on the last slide, reasoning and uh, formal verification. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, I mean, especially with a lot of talk now going on on adversarial robustness in neural networks and things of those kinds. Uh, I mean, how do you view the connection between formal verification, reasoning, adversarial robustness? I mean, they're all related in some way. Yeah. Uh, so, but at the same time, they're approached from different perspectives. So I just wanted to get your thoughts to see. Yeah. So actually, I meant something very specific when I wrote this. Here. Let me just me say what I what I mean, and then I answer your question, right? So to me, um, I've been actually studying how people verify uh, things like neural networks. Um, there's a, there's a bunch of uh, effort in the CAV community and also in the PLDA community. What they're doing is actually they take uh, deep neural networks and convert them into formulae. And you could convert them into formulae because you know, you, every operator that you have could be you know, ReLU or it could be uh, a sigmoid or whatever. You could just write it down um, as a function. And you could actually write the output uh, as a function of the input by cascading all of them. I mean, it's, un it's actually not human interpretable, but that function nevertheless exists. And then you could actually write a specification for it. And typically, the specification for it is also not very clear. I mean, you would, you, it's not very entirely clear you know, what a specification for a neural network should look like. And that's where actually you know, people are doing things like, oh, I don't know what it should do, but at least it should be robust. It, too, it, should, be, it should be robust to adversarial perturbations. And those you could actually write as actually formulae. And then they actually check whether this neural network satisfies the specification. And there's, you know, there's people like, you know, if you look at David Dill's group in Stanford, they've actually built a verifier that actually can do that. Can actually take a neural network and actually check whether it actually satisfies adversarial specifications. Scalability, I think, continues to be a serious, serious concern. I've not seen many results on how large neural networks it can handle. Um, and it's actually not even clear whether those kind of specifications tell me whether the self-driving car will crash. You know, it's unlikely, you know, maybe it's robust. It's maybe, maybe if you perturb it, it won't, but it might still crash the car. Uh, it's not entirely clear whether, see, the, the specification of what the thing should do is actually still uh, an unknown uh, problem. My own view on this, actually, you know, is that I have a, a completely, I, I have a more wild idea about this, which I'm uh, exploring, which is, <clears throat> uh, if you actually think about what we are generating, right, I actually presented this work to, you know, some people uh, in, 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 in the AI group and MSR Redmond, and they looked at it and they told me, oh, you did all this gymnastics. But what you're finally generating is a sequence of deterministic programs. Right? You're using probability to do all of that. Right? Finally, you're just generating a bunch of scripts. There is actually randomness in your system. Right? So I think, actually, you know, I'm not covering the whole set of programs. Right? The kind of programs that I'm studying, I think, are very specific. Things like extraction and so on, I think they're very specific. Um, so I think, you know, but I have, I have a feeling that actually I have some intuitions that even for things like self-driving cars and so on, I could probably synthesize what are called monitors using these kinds of techniques. And those monitors can play, I think, uh, an important role in bridging the completely understandable neural networks and what your specifications might be. And this is early thinking that, uh, that we are doing in this space, yeah. My question is kind of related to the previous question. Uh, it's, uh, so it relates to the constraints. So in one of the slides, I saw the word soft constraints. Uh, so I was wondering whether, I mean, can you talk more about that in particular? Yeah, so the reason why we wrote soft constraints is that you know, a lot of these constraints that we write, they tend to be one-sided. 
you know, for example, you know, my database of Indian names could be incomplete. So I have more confidence when the constraint says actually it doesn't, doesn't look like a name. Uh, it actually, it does look like a name. I have more confidence that my constraint is saying something useful. When somebody says it doesn't look like a name, it just could just be that my database is incomplete. Uh, so as a result, right, in our algorithms, uh, when we say, you know, we favor programs that satisfy the constraint, right, we can't really be absolute, you know, we have, to, we have weights and we have to tune them. And those constraints, you know, do end up being soft as, a, as opposed to, you know, type systems and so on where these constraints end up being hard. Yeah, this is just reality of how these things work, I think. Yeah. So what would amount to making them hard? Is it, is it even possible? Because yeah, I, I think it would be very hard because actually I don't, I don't know how to write, uh, you know, type constraints, which maybe for date I'll be able to do something. Uh, you know, but for Indian name, I don't know what a constraint I can write, which if you give me an Indian name, I don't know, I can satisfy. 